Hello friends, how are you? Hope you're enjoying some fall activities. We have a great episode in store for today. Um, we're gonna be taking a trip over to Tammy White's Wing and a Prayer Farm in Shaftesbury, Vermont, which is not far from us here in Manchester. Tammy is a, she raises sheep, she raises chickens, she raises llamas. She has an amazing farm. Um, and she's a wonderful person, but she also, what's really interesting and what I think many of those people here in this audience who may dye their own wool or are interested in hand dyed uh, or how to dye your own wool naturally, Tammy dyes all of her yarn um, on her farm using plant matter, flowers, really gorgeous process. And today she's going to actually give a short demonstration of how that process works. So be sure to watch uh, the film to the very end to see illustration of her dyeing, hand dyeing with beautiful flowers, a silk pillowcase. So I'm going to be talking about Elizabeth Zimmerman. Elizabeth Zimmerman is one of my favorite teachers and I, what I love about Elizabeth is that she doesn't just teach you one technique, she teaches you how to design a sweater of your choice. And so we're gonna be talking about the five ways that Elizabeth empowers us to be knitting designers through her basic techniques. Um, this sweater here that I'm wearing is an Elizabeth Zimmerman pattern. It's a basic bottom-up raglan sweater um, that I knit in the round. Um, it has raglan decreases, a turtleneck. It's using um, eco wool in a colorway which I can't remember off the top of my head, but I love it. It's a beautiful blue. Um, this leads very nicely into how Elizabeth empowers us to be uh, designers. This sweater is 100% based on gauge. Once, and I didn't have to get gauge, I actually just took my gauge, which I really, really love because if you're like me and you struggle with gauge, many knitters will struggle to get the gauge that the knitter requests in a pattern. Um, it's much easier to knit using a wool that you like with the gauge, with a needle you prefer and get a gauge that you prefer and then take your gauge and multiply it by a certain number of stitches, multiply it into to create a certain number of stitches to get the width that you want and then follow a basic recipe to create a sweater, which is what Elizabeth teaches us through her Elizabeth's percentage system, which can be found in any of her books. I recommend The Opinionated Knitter as a first start. It's just, it's it's a beautiful book. It's got lots of pictures. It's got lots of useful patterns in it. And um, I recommend getting it through Schoolhouse Press. Um, they, are, they are the company that Elizabeth started so many years ago and it's still a family run company. Cully Swanson is there. That is Meg Swanson's son and that is Elizabeth's grandson. So it's just really a pleasure to give them business. They have beautiful wools there. The sweater that I'm knitting right now, um, which is a cable sweater using heritage wool I got from their website. And um, they're just so helpful and wonderful and friendly and I can't recommend them enough. Um, and that is a really great wool and it's at a great price first way that she teaches us how to be knitting designers is she guides us with gauge. She teaches us the importance of gauge. Once we know our gauge, as I said, we can cast on the number of stitches that we need and we can create the garment that we desire. The second reason that Elizabeth teaches us to be, to think like a designer is that she teaches us to think mathematically and proportionally about our knits. So if we take our knitting and we put it into an overview of a circle, and we have the number of stitches that we need to cast on for the widest part of our body, we have a certain amount of real estate that we can fill up on those needles using the stitches. If, for example, we're doing a cable sweater like I just showed you, each of those cable patterns has a certain number of stitches. So they need to fit onto that, onto that, um, that needle and it needs to be balanced and proportioned and we need to fill in between we can't just have pattern next to pattern next to pattern there has to be ribbing there has to be some kind of purling whatever there has to be something to visually break it up and make it look balanced and pleasing to the eye so she teaches us to do that to look at our work and to create a circle and to put our put our patterns into that circle and create a balanced and pleasing proportion 
The third reason that Elizabeth teaches us to be designers is that she understands wool. Now she always worked with um, the wools that she produced and she she did many garments with using different, using those wools over and over again. When you use a wool over and over again, you really do get to understand its properties and what it's good for. Now this, I hadn't used this wool before, but I knew that it would be a relatively soft wool. It'd be good for some kind of garment that I would want to wear close to my body. I knew that it would be um, fairly sturdy, that it wasn't gonna pill easily. Um, so these are the things that you will know as you get to know your yarn over and over again. And she's teaching me what I'm doing now is I'm really trying to limit myself to about five different yarns and repeatedly use those yarns so that I get to know those properties extraordinarily well. And then as I start to become more proficient at creating garments, I will know I'll, I'll be able to use those yarns in a in a mindful way, in a way that is actually intentional, is really not mindful, but intentional, and to bring certain qualities to the sweater that I want to create or the garment that I'm looking to create. The fourth way that Elizabeth teaches us to think like a designer is that she gives us license to think about our knitting, to apply various techniques that we've learned in the past and think about how they could work within the pattern that we are currently working with or within the garment that we are currently creating. So for example, in the V-neck Erin cardigan, she says in the beginning of this newsletter, which is, contains the recipe for this cardigan, if you wish to do this as a raglan, go back and visit newsletter number eight and apply those techniques here. She doesn't tell you exactly how to do it. She tells you to think about how it was done and apply those techniques to this garment. So this really gives us um, ownership over our knitting, which is her big thing. And her, or she would say she really teaches us to be the boss of our own knitting. So the fifth and final way that Elizabeth encourages us, teaches us to think like a designer is that she gives us ownership or encouragement to take ownership over color. In her color work patterns, she immediately offers many, many options for you. And in the beginning as a new knitter, I felt overwhelmed by that. But what it's actually done for me is it forced me to get my feet wet with color, to play around with color, to think about the sweater and the effect that I wanted that sweater to have. Did I want it to be bold? Did I want it to be subdued? What colors would look good on my skin tone? And I started to think about color in ways that I had never thought about it before. Color is such a huge component of creativity and it's a huge piece of a garment. So now color is my favorite thing to play with. And it's the first thing that I go to when I think of a sweater and what I wanna knit is the color. What is before texture, before fit, before everything else, I think what kind of color do I wanna use for this sweater? Well, just a word about what I'm working on currently. Um, as you know, as I showed you just a few seconds ago, I am making lots of progress with my V-neck Aran cardigan. It's, um, I've already started, um, I've started the decreasing around the steak. So it's starting to get that puffy, as Elizabeth would call it, the pigeon chested effect, where it kind of comes out as I decrease on either side of it. Um, and then once I finish the decreases, I will cast off for the front and work the back separately, back and forth, casting off on each side and uh, to create the higher the back, the, the back neck and then pick up stitches for the sleeves. So it's coming along. It's, um, it's a really enjoyable knit. I'm very, very pleased with the progress so far. I like this yarn. It's um, very, very sturdy and very uh, textural. It feels very, very textural and this feels like it will last forever. I'm so pleased my daughter will have this and she'll have it for many years to remember me. Um, not that I'm going anywhere, but it will always be a memory that she has that I made for her. And it's really, it's quite lovely and it's really classic and I'm just really proud of it so far. Very, very pleased. Um, I did have kind of a misfire this, this just yesterday. Hintmerstein, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Um, she's just currently come up with a, a pattern called the, it's, I, I can't remember it. It's got a, it's a German, I think it's a German name. Um, and I am working on it 
currently and how it works is a really it's a really interesting pattern it starts with a provisional cast on and it creates it starts it's a v-neck and it's um it starts with you create the v and then you work down this kind of it's kind of hard to put over the sweater but you can see this is the shoulder and the um the underarm comes here and then this is the v but what i've discovered that i don't really do i have it on yeah so what I discovered, what I, I think I'm going to take it, rip it back because I don't, when I'm knitting um, back and forth like this, it has a different gauge than it does in the round, which you hear all the time. And I just feel like this gauge is a little sloppy looking and I'm not pleased with it. And it's, um, it took me a really long time, maybe six or seven tries to get the gauge, which was 25 stitches, four inches, um, and I did finally, I always, I think I knit um, more loosely. So I always have to go down to a very small needle, but it just, it feels too loose for me. So I'm either going to, I love the color, um, but I think I'm going to, I think I might go to a different pattern because I'm just not proficient. I, I, I'm so used to knitting in the round that I'm really, I'm not able to get the correct gauge. And I don't think I can go down. This is a size two needle. I don't think I want to knit this in a size one. And I'm not even sure that it will, how it will look in a size one. So I think I'm going to need to find a different um, V-neck sweater pattern and to use this Tibetan wool. I love this Tibetan wool. It's so soft. It's by M. Yak and it's um, really, really beautiful and special, special, special wool. So in order to, to, treat to give the wool the sweater it deserves i'm gonna have to change patterns so you win some you lose some but you always learn something and stay tuned for our trip to wing in a prayer farm where at the end of the video tammy is going to demonstrate hand dyeing with natural plants a beautiful silk pillowcase bye for now and if you like what you're seeing here please do like and subscribe to this channel to become part of our community. Namaste, bye-bye. So we're headed to Wing and a Prayer Farm in Sunderland, Vermont. Tammy White is an amazing local yarn um, producer. She raises her own sheep. She has a variety of sheep and she dyes, she hand dyes all of her wools using natural plant-based materials. So her yarn is absolutely gorgeous and really worth the trip if you're in uh, Vermont, Southern Vermont. The other reason that it's great that we're going to see Tammy today is that she may have some laying hens for us that we are interested because those of you who also follow the other information I post about in here, we've had some chicken problems, including two roosters that we didn't plan for and um, being down some laying hens. So I hope it'll be great if she has some, some laying hens for us. So here we are coming up to Tammy's farm. It's such a pretty drive and it was a perfect fall day for this. It was a little cloudy, but the sun kept bursting out, showing all the beautiful colors. And it just makes me so happy and it makes me feel so blessed that I live in such a beautiful area where I get to see this every fall. Here we are arriving at the farm and it's so great to be here. I've been here in the summer and the fall and it's even beautiful in the winter. It's just such a beautiful location in, a, in an open spot 
and soon we're going to see her sheep up on the right hand side welcome to the farm soon we'll see her sheep up on the right hand side and tammy just loves her sheep and cares so well for them it's such a pleasure and she takes such pride in her beautiful hand dyeing process using all of the beauty that surrounds her on this beautiful piece of land so if that's something that is interesting to you using natural dyes and yarns use that come from sheep that have lived a beautiful loving life i encourage you to check out her website at wing and a prayer farm and i'm going to be showing you some of her beautiful wools in just a few moments Of course, I couldn't resist coming over to take a look in her chicken coop to see what kind of chickies she had. And I think I recognize some beef elders which would fit so happily into our flock. Hope to see you again soon, chickies. And there's a beautiful rooster which we don't need any more of. <laughs> I would combine that with indigo. My indigo is in the garden and I was going to do a little indigo, um, a little fresh indigo dyeing for you afterwards, but I, I got to go pick it. So we can go do that together if you want to. And then um, color. Um, I'm just going to show you a little, I'm like bouncing around because this is just a, a little demo. It's not a full on workshop. And I have all these jars because I was going to make up some color, but I'm kind of, I kind of need hot water for that and I don't have any. 
that you should do. Um, it's like you can, there are lots of things to naturally die with. And on my farm, I grow matter for the matter roots to get these reds. I grow marigolds. Marigolds are easy, right? They just start right up and pick the flowers every single day. So the way I harvest is like I just go out and deadhead everything and then I dry it either on a screen in the sunshine or I have dehydrators, but the dehydrators require electricity. We try to do as much without adding in resources as possible. And then um, that's for harvesting it, for keeping it for the long term. But you also can just pick and put it right in the kettle. And if you walked around with me earlier, you may have seen my kettle of sulfur cosmos. I know it looks a little gross, but the color is amazing. And I can show you that after because we'll go see it, but we'll also go pick the indigo. But the sulfur cosmos, when they're dry, are like this. And um, that means that I can pick as many, you know, I can dry them and then I can store them long term versus uh, the freezer, which is another method of storing. I just don't have as much freezer space and many of you may understand that, you know. Um, so I'm gonna show you a little, it's like a party trick almost. It's a, the most fun thing is to bundle dye. So this is a silk. And it's a, just a great way to show off uh, how natural dyes can um, be used um, with, without worrying about the science of it. So the silk has been prepared already. Um, I had a pillowcase and I prepared it and I'm gonna show you that after. But I'm gonna demonstrate how it goes on this little kerchief. First thing in natural dyeing is to make sure that whatever you're dyeing is well scoured because if there are any particles like impurity or, or like in my yarns that come back from the mill, there's a certain amount of mill grease on the wool still, and we want it cleaned off, so we want the water to rinse clear. So after that step of scouring, so every time you see a dyed skein of yarn uh, from this farm, know that it came back from the mill and then it was scoured first. And then after that scouring, it needs to be mordanted. And mordanting is the next step in preparing it to take up the dye. There are certain dyes that don't require a mordant step. So mordant means to bind. So when we mordant the fiber, we're preparing it to bind to the pigment of the natural dye. So I use alum or aluminum sulfate to use as a mordant, but I also use like rhubarb leaves. They have a great, uh, they have a great, uh, they're full of oxalic acid and that also helps to act as a mordant. But like when you use something like rhubarb leaves, which I use the stalks for pies and the leaves for mordant, you want to be careful because I would like brew it like a pot of soup or something. Obviously you don't want anyone to eat it because it's toxic, but also inhaling the fumes, they're strong. So you would want to wear a mask um, and you wouldn't want children or pets to get a hold of that. So you're not going to like, it's natural, but you're not going to disregard that it's potentially strong or toxic or whatever. So rhubarb leaves can be a mordant. Um, acorns can be a mordant uh, because acorns are loaded with tannins. Oak leaves are loaded with tannins. And there are so many things in nature. But if you want a clean result, like clean or like the purest result, then aluminum sulfate is what I would use because it will... Um, it will leave it undyed. You know, there's no residual color. Whereas, like, I know that the rhubarb leaves will impart a little bit of a yellow green hue to it. So it's going to modify the color somewhat. But aluminum sulfate is clear. So I would, my, my strength of, um, of aluminum sulfate for mordantine is usually two to 5% of the weight of fiber. So if it's 100 grams of fiber, then it's two to five grams of aluminum sulfate, which I would dissolve and then I would soak the fiber in. And I would use hot water and let it soak it up. And so you can use a, a heat source and you can soak it in the heat source and then um, 45 minutes or whatever and call it mordanted. Or you can do what I do, which is the lazy dyer's way. So I have these kettles all over the backyard and one of them is purely a mordant kettle and I put my yarn in it and I let it sit and then I get back to it in a day or two and then I take it out and drain it and then it's mordanted. And if you're mordanting silk, like a silk pillowcase, which I'm gonna show you, or a, a kerchief or cotton or whatever, you can set it and forget it. You don't have to sit over the pot. 
Um, but then once mordanted, it's forever mordanted, so you don't have to redo this step. And it can be dried and then kept, um, you know, uh, you can keep it in a well-marked storage because otherwise you will forget if you mordanted it. Mm -hmm. I know you will, because I do mm -hmm. all the time. I'm like, did I mordant? So you have to have a system so that you'll remember. And then um, when you get together with your friends so that you can have a dye party or you get ready for your dye weekend because you know the marigolds are all going to be in bloom that weekend or whatever it is, then all your stuff is already mordanted and you'll be so happy. All you have to do is play now with your dye. So it's been mordanted here. Um, and so the next step is then to dye. So if we were dyeing it in a kettle, it's all ready to go in the kettle, but we're going to do something that's called bundle dyeing. So we're going to use, uh, we're going to fight the wind a little bit, but we're going to use um, some of the dyer's chamomile and one of the Coreopsis flowers got in there and that's okay. I love them too. They're like a pumpkin-y color. And then we're going to put, oh, ho oh, oh. we're going to put a few of the sulfur cosmos on. So they give us kind of an orangish color and the dyer's chamomile are sort of a yellowy color. Not sort of, they are yellow. And the, the Coreopsis blooms are, if I had more, I'd put more in there, but I don't see them. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And then I have some dahlia petals. So the dahlias are so pretty, aren't they? So we pick them and we enjoy the blooms. And then after um, after the blooms are starting to be spent, we hang them up to dry. And sometimes I snip them off and I dry them in the dehydrator. But then I use the petals when they're all dehydrated. And I'll show you after an example of what the colors look like. And then, let's see. I think that, that we'll, we'll call it, what else do I have in here? I don't really have anything in there right now that I want to use. We'll call it a day on that. So for bundle dyeing, it's, um, the idea is to be testing, in a way, your dye stuffs and see what the colors are. It's not necessarily something like that I care strongly about the results. I, I know that it's going to be an impressionistic result. It's going to be um, muted colors and they're going to be sort of random and it's going to make for a really beautiful kerchief in the end. So when I bundle dye, I just, I roll or I fold. You can like fan fold. It's not that precise. It's not necessary to be that precise. There are some methods of dyeing where we're binding and folding the shibori tying and sewing things to make a particular repeat or pattern. But in this kind of dyeing, we're not. We're just, we're just, I just made it like a cinnamon roll. And then I'll use some string to tie it off. But sometimes we can bundle dye using um, a rod or a stick and I can show you how that goes. And the reason why I'm showing this off is because I'm trying to make it like user friendly for you. If you're new to dyeing, it might be overwhelming to think about trying to dye um, your own yardage or your own yarn or whatever. It might be that you don't want to be, you know, trying to handle too much. So this is a great way to sort of baby step into dyeing with natural materials. So now she's all ready to go into a steamer basket, even though I had it above the steamer basket, because when I was carrying it over this morning, it dudged a little bit, the technical word. So it had, sulfur cosmos in it and something else that I forgot to tell you about a little bit of cochineal and I'll talk about that in a minute and it had dahlias and it had dyer's chamomile and I steamed it for 45 minutes and then I let it sit overnight and that's what we get so it's a lot of fun. So this is um, a beautiful pillowcase. It's already, I'll give it a rinse, but it has been mordanted so that it's gonna last forever. That color will last forever. And it's a real treat for me because winter is long, but I have like a flower garden on a silk pillowcase to keep my, to keep me sweet dreaming, right? Every night about flowers in the spring, in the summer.
Okay, so we had a really nice afternoon at Tammy's farm. I picked up some really nice um, a skein of her island and I'm going to make Mark a hat with this. It's really soft and spun really nicely. It's a nice tight spin. And I also am going to make the pillow that she demonstrated in the dyeing workshop. So I'll show you how that turns out. <laughs> 